Hey Nintendo fans, it's Jay Wits here, and welcome to the new Nintendo Fact of the Day. It's been a handful of months, but I finally found time to play the awesome Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze, and it got me thinking, what would be a fun thing from Donkey Kong's past that would make a good Fact of the Day topic? I've decided to revive this old relic, the Donkey Kong Bongos. Let's check it out. The Donkey Kong Bongos came at an awkward point in the Rhythm Games timeline. This was just before Activision struck gold with Guitar Hero, before milking it to the point of implosion, and just after the rise of the home console rhythm games, such as Parappa the Rappa and Amplitude. The DK bongos are certainly interesting to say the least. They're made mostly of plastic, but have a nice weight to them and a responsive feedback when drumming. There are only four buttons. Start, pound left, pound right, and clapping, which can be picked up by the controller's built-in microphone. The controller is lightweight enough where it could be played in a lamp, but in general, I find the most comfortable way to play this thing is on a carpeted floor, where there's minimal recoil every time you hit it. For better and for worse, there's one last thing to note about these drums. They absolutely own the room. When even one person is clapping and slamming their hands down on this thing, it is impossible to simply sit in the same room and enjoy yourself. Here's an example of what to expect during the bongo session. So if you have a big family, good luck convincing anybody that you'll be taking up the entire room with sound. But enough on the bongos themselves. We're here to take a look at how these babies worked with games. The library of DK Bongos games isn't exactly expansive, but we begin the journey with Donkey Konga, a rhythm game for the Nintendo GameCube alongside the bongo controllers. The game uses a less common right-to-left horizontal beat pattern, but the actual gameplay is just like your average rhythm game. Hit the beats when they line up with the marker. Donkey Konga has a variety of in-game inputs, with icons for drumming left, right, both at the same time, clapping, and rolls, where you pound in a specific type of drum as often as possible over a stretch. Immediately revisiting this game, I encountered a problem that I would have never expected. Why am I so bad? Like, seriously, I can't even beat the easiest stages. I rocked this game as a kid. Rhythm games are one of the games I'm best at. What's going on here? After frantically consulting the internet, it turns out it wasn't me that was bad, but my television. LED HD TVs are a thing of the future, but it turns out that depending on your TV size and model, there can be a considerable amount of lag when an HD TV tries to input composite video signals. Because of this, there can be a slight delay between you inputting an action and the game actually receiving and using that action. When playing a normal game, you might not even notice the lag. With the rhythm game where the timing is absolutely everything, even half a second of lag can be deadly. I learned that many modern TVs now come with what's called a game mode, which can help reduce lag, and using component cables can help a little too. But even with all that, I found that my experience was just slightly off on an HD TV. The only solution for an old game like Donkey Konga is to play on an old school CRT TV. You actually see hundreds of these things at fighting game tournaments for the same reason preventing lag. Now that I no longer suck, let's get back to the game. It's pretty standard stuff in terms of mechanics, but there's something about physically pounding and clapping that makes it fun. It's a real shame the songs aren't as fun as the bongos themselves. Just think about the bongo. It's an African-Cuban instrument, so you'd think it'd be fun to play along with songs of Cuban or African cultures. Or, in general, just being a percussion instrument, you'd think that they'd at least work with songs that have a very distinct beat, maybe a heavy bass. Most songs in the game don't fit any of these categories. A good example of a solid pick is Queen's We Will Rock You. Everybody knows that opening stomp stomp clap. It's an easy transition for people who have never played a rhythm game before, and it works. But then you get things like Diddy's Diddy's. At first I thought, oh man, what if this is a compilation of songs from Diddy Kong Racing? That'd be sick! What? Ugh. Nintendo is... just being Nintendo. I get that kids want to play Nintendo games, but even I can't imagine a child opting to play songs like Bingo and Row 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 Your Boat on the bongos. Anyway, the song selection on Konga is all over the place. There's punk rock, classical, video game music, a small selection of Latin music that you'd think would actually work with bongos, and some hilariously bad pop. Do you remember Leslie Carter's Like Wow? I don't. Because that's one of like three songs older than the year 2000 on this soundtrack, and this game came out in 2004. The rest is a surprisingly old mix of iconic 60s, 70s, and 80s tracks. Every licensed song is done by a cover band, so if you didn't like it before, you'll probably hate the knockoff version. While the tracks certainly aren't what I'd call hip, they're at least memorable, and there's a few gems here or there. 
my personal favorite, the Pokemon theme song. Aside from the single player mode, there's also a simple multiplayer battle mode with pal blocks to mess with your opponent. It's fun with a friend, but nothing too flashy. And finally, you can use your coins collected from performing well on songs to buy new sounds, harder tracks, and mini games. Personally, I'd only buy harder tracks. The new sounds are obnoxious to hear if you actually want to listen to the music while you're drumming, and the minigames are really lame tack-ons. You can either juggle bananas, play whack-a-mole, or play a tedious climbing game. And the minigames remind me, this game looks terrible for a GameCube game. Most of the characters are just pre-rendered with two different kinds of animation frames. In fact, aside from the higher sound quality, I'm not sure there's anything that would have prevented Donkey Konga from working as a Nintendo 64 title. I definitely get that you're going to be focusing on notes throughout the entire game, and visuals definitely aren't a rhythm game's most important element, but stuff like this just makes the game feel a little lazy. Overall, Donkey Konga is decent. The core mechanics of drum rhythm are great, but it's a combination of lackluster modes, visuals, and song selection that really keep it from being a must-own. But the funny thing is, at least one of these problems, songs, can change depending on where you live. There are not one, not two, but three different versions of the original Donkey Konga for Europe, North America, and Japan. The European PAL version has a lot more classic tracks that I personally like, such as Queen's Don't Stop Me Now, Earth, Wind & Fire's September, and Lady Marmalade? I unironically love that song. They even have more video game music than the US version, including the Smash Bros. Melee theme and Rainbow Cruise. Japan's version is covered with old J-pop, a few anime soundtracks, and surprisingly more Latin music than we got in the US, like La Bamba and Mas Que Nada. I prefer both the PAL and the Japanese versions over the one I grew up with. It's a shame Nintendo region locks their systems, making it so hard to play games from different areas. Moving on from the first Konga, just seven months after the original, we saw Donkey Konga 2. Donkey Konga 1 had some weird song choices, but there was something almost charming about its strange mix. Konga 2, on the other hand, has a distinct tone. It just happens to be consistently horrible. Here's what I imagine happening. People probably complained at Konga 1's song selection, saying that it was too old-fashioned. So some Nintendo executives decided that they needed to make Konga 2 hip. Because of this, the North American Konga 2 completely removes video game music and classics in favor of second-rate pop and rock. Fun fact, this is actually the only Donkey Kong game to get a T for teen rating. For lyrics. It's about to get real. I don't quite understand Konga 2. It came out in 2005, but most of the pop songs it has come from 2001 or even earlier. I know some people joke that Nintendo can be a few years in the past when it comes to modern trends, but here it is literally apparent. Are there some good songs? Sure. Shaggy's Boombastic actually seems to make sense of bongos, and it's a shock we never got more reggae in general from these games. It works. But even then, that song came out in 1995. Shaggy had more popular songs in the early 2000s that they could have gone with instead. Good Charlotte's The Anthem is another decent pick, but after destroying a lava golem with a baseball bat to the same song in the rhythm game Elite Beat Agents, I just can't quite get as hyped for it anymore. But past the few diamonds in the rough, and you're looking at stuff like Hilary Duff. And even when there is a song that I might have liked back in the day, like Usher's You Don't Have to Call, the cover is so bad that it doesn't even sound like Usher. The irony is that the harder Donkey Konga 2 tried to be relevant, the more forgettable it is today when compared to the original. There are still some slightly different mini-games and a few challenge modes, but with songs this bad, it's really hard to get into the rest of the experience. And of course, once again, both Japan and Europe get the good stuff. Japan gets tons of high-energy anime themes, and Europe has a whopping five video game tracks, from Green Greens to Mute City. And finally, there was even a Japan-exclusive Donkey Konga 3 that added even more music. The Japanese soundtrack does what it does best. Anime themes like Dragon Ball Z, Full Metal Alchemist, and Bobo Bo, with lots of video game music, including my personal favorite, the Mona Pizza theme from WarioWare. There's even over 20 unlockable NES themes from both Nintendo and Namco, who helped work on the series. In the end, I feel like Donkey Konga was a fun rhythm concept that never really tapped its full potential. Honestly, I think the bongos would have been incredible with more reggae and hip-hop, but none of the three regions ever really touched those genres, even when Nintendo was bold enough to jump into the dark waters of T for Teen. 
What we ultimately got was an awesome instrumental controller that never seemed to have the best genre of music to play with it. By the end of 2005, we saw Guitar Hero, which took the great idea of a separate musical controller you could play with your consoles, but paired it with one of the world's most popular instruments. It took the world by storm as the must-own rhythm game, and Donkey Konga was never heard from again. That might be all for my opinions on Donkey Konga, but it's not all I have to say about the Donkey Kong bongos. And that's because Nintendo released the exclusive to the GameCube, and specifically for the bongos, Donkey Kong Jungle Beat. It's not a rhythm game this time, it's a platformer. Oh, I know what you're thinking. Can you really have a platforming game that runs just on this instead of a conventional controller? You guys will have to tune into part two to find out. Today's episode of Nintendo Fact of the Day is brought to you guys by Audible.com. I know you've heard me talk about Audible before in the past, and there's a reason for that. And that is because Audible is the closest thing I've ever had to a regular supporter. Somebody who's really helping me get you guys the best videos, the highest quality possible, all while affording the best equipment that I can get to support the show. So the least I can do is talk about Audible for a little bit, and as usual, they're doing some cool stuff in combination with this channel to help you guys get some free stuff if you're interested in audiobooks. Audible.com is a site where they provide the most audiobooks in the world, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a book that you listen to instead of read, so that you can still hear a book if you're doing something like driving on a road trip, walking around groceries, working out, whatever you're doing where you have your ears free and can listen. Just like before, we're running a code alongside Audible, where if you go to audible.com slash jwits, you can get yourself a free audiobook to listen to however you like, whether that's on your desktop, on your laptop, or on a mobile device like your phone or iPod. Last time I looked at Console Wars, which documents the history between Sega and Nintendo, and even though it did take more of a Sega spin on things, I got so many of you guys writing me on Twitter and email that you really enjoyed the book. So this time I'm recommending one in a similar vein. It's called Super Mario, How Nintendo Conquered America. And it's an audiobook all about the history of Nintendo, what makes Mario iconic, and what makes Nintendo in general different from the other gaming companies around the world. Really hope you guys enjoy the book, and I will see you guys soon with part two for the Donkey Kong Bongos Jungle Beat.